Well, hello there, everyone. Welcome to a brand new episode of The Dark Parade. I am your host, Bo, and you are in for a treat this uh, this episode. We are talking about the latest adaptation of the uh, Resident Evil series of video games. This one is called Resident Evil Welcome to Raccoon City, and I am joined by Court, uh, Court Psyops from Cinema Psyops, to discuss this movie because both of us uh, enjoy those games. And so it was a good chat between two people who are sort of predisposed to enjoy this movie, at least on some level. So uh, I, we mentioned this in the upfront, but I'm going to say it again here. Uh, we do talk about this film in a lot of detail. So if you have not seen the movie or played the first two video games, then you are probably going to be spoiled on some stuff, but it depends on uh, how you feel about these things. Do, do you think that you can substantially spoil a movie called Resident Evil Welcome to Raccoon City? Uh, that remains to be seen. So sit back and relax. Uh, it's a good conversation, uh, as it always is with Court, and I think that's just about enough out of me to kick things off. Uh, here's the review slash discussion of, uh, of Resident Evil. Enjoy. All right, folks, as promised, the one and only Court Psyops has returned to lay down his smartness in the field of battle, intellectually speaking, or something. So, Court. <laughs> yeah, I I'm not sure... What that meant, I feel like I'm living in Twin Peaks right now and that I can't trust the owls, but this is some damn fine coffee. Yeah, well, you know, if all you get out of Twin Peaks is a love for coffee, that's still worthwhile. Um, but <laughs> as uh, listeners are uh, sure to know, this is the water and this is the well. Uh, drink deep and descend. Um, anyway, we are here to talk about Resident Evil Welcome to Raccoon City which is a recent movie, one of the, the more recent films we've ever covered on this show, along with, like, um, Last Night in Soho was a recent watch, or a recent release, rather. And uh, Is this it's technically 2021 because it got released at the tail end of 2021, didn't it? I believe that's right. And it was one of those movies that I, I remember when it came out and it hit theaters, and this wasn't like a COVID thing of like, well, I don't want to go to the theaters and, and get myself a, a whopping case of the Rona. I was just like, there is no way I'm going to pay for Welcome to Raccoon City to go to a theater and sit down and watch this. But I would love to see it. And In all fairness, the trailer made it look like it was way more hot garbage than it actually is. The trailer mm. for this movie didn't really sell it too well. Yeah, I mean, we'll we'll debate that last part about it not being true garbage. I don't know that I don't know that it isn't garbage. It's schlock. There is no question about that. And I think it's just a, a question of like how you respond to that schlock. But regardless of that, like I remember thinking I I want to see this, but I'm not going to go to the theaters. And I was like hitting the refresh button over and over again. Like I was F5ing a Google search on like when does this come to streaming? <laughs> and and then when they announced like okay it's going to come to streaming and it's going to be you know the early access $20 I was like oh, no 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 if I'm not going to pay you know the 10 bucks or 12 bucks or whatever to go to that's the where matinee, you get 10 of your friends together to pay like two bucks a piece to watch it <laughs> I, I don't have 10 friends <laughs> five friends who pay four bucks yeah, I could probably swing that. But, it, like, then that means I've got to convince them to watch this movie. And there's no way that they're going to fall for that. <laughs> right. Well, that's where you, you, you hit up your boy Court and you'd be like, uh, Court, get this for me. Right. <laughs> well, it, pay for it. <laughs> the point being, it took forever to uh, for this movie, seemingly, just to come out on plain old, you know, Amazon rental, where I could get it for five or six bucks, because that's what I was willing to pay. To, to watch this movie in my own home for five or six dollars that was my bar and but then i watched it and i was like you know for five or six bucks on my couch not bad not bad welcome to raccoon city 
And in watching it a couple of more times, uh, by the way, fair warning to uh, listeners out there who may be uh, considering purchasing the Blu-ray of Resident Evil Welcome to Raccoon City. Uh, no commentary, which is a bit of a bummer. Yeah, they're starting to make a lot more of those burn-on-demand Blu-rays. And it's getting worse and worse to where they're just stripping away special features. So, yeah, yeah it's like it's like if you're going to buy it on digital, that's one thing. But if you want to have your own copy of it, at least give me something to make the Blu-ray worthwhile. Right. Well, I mean, it's got a, a handful of special features. It's got like three featurettes on there. And I watch those and that's fine. But uh, I like a, a good director's commentary, you know, and the director of this film, Johannes Gutenberg. Uh, I think is his name. Hold on. That's not really his name. Let me look it up. Um, <laughs> it's, but it, it's something Johannes. Um, but at any rate, he was very enthusiastic about discussing the film. And it was a real bummer to me that, oh, you just don't have that on the, uh, on, on the Blu-ray, which you kind of should for a movie like this. Is this a Sony release for the Blu-ray? Cause they pull yeah. shit like time. Yeah. So later on, or sometimes what I, I think it was like you had to buy the digital version of Upgrade if you wanted to get the audio contra like the audio commentary. Nah, that's garbage. Johannes and Roberts then, is the guy's name. Just yeah, uh, and then yeah. the the Blu-ray of Upgrade on initial release or something like that had like featurettes and things on it, but you couldn't get all of the features on one thing. I'll tell you another thing. This is a little bit uh, off the subject, but that's kind of what <laughs> Court and I do when he comes on the show. Um, I was looking for a Blu-ray. I, I was actually looking for a 4K, which doesn't exist. Um, but I was looking for a Blu-ray of the old John Huston Moby Dick with Gregory Peck and Orson Welles and all that. Yeah. Um, completely out of print. Uh, the only thing that you can get that's still seemingly in print are DVDs of that movie. And I'm like, why is there not a wonderful edition, like a Criterion edition of this movie? Which, you know, I don't know if you've ever seen the Gregory Peck version of Moby Dick. It's an outstanding film. And it really bummed me out. I was looking for that just this very day. And meanwhile, Court, Orca has a commentary. It's not the director, but it's like a film historian commentary on Orca. And Moby Dick doesn't have one. <laughs> Well, that just goes to show you how they treat us. <laughs> yeah, I just I mean, I think it shows where the culture is. Where where Orca is revered above Moby Dick, but eh, you know, there are worse fates, I suppose. Um well, what Moby Dick definitely lacked was an spontaneous <laughs> miscarriage of a whale right. line and, yeah. on the back of a boat. If, if Moby Dick would have had that in the Gregory Peck version, clearly it would be more respected in cinema. Yeah, at no point is Moby Dick's wife hauled onto the back of a fishing boat and and a baby Moby Dick pops out and they have to just ho literally hose it off the deck. Um, boy, work as some movie. Um, right. <laughs> but back to Raccoon City and Resident oh, Evil. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so, um, so when did you see it? Did you go to the theater for this, or did you just catch up with it on, on home video? Uh, it was pretty much home video. It was one of the ones where the wife and I wanted to watch something in the theater room. So yeah, she liked the other Resident Evil movies, so um, we both just decided to check it out. And, I mean, like you said, for X amount of dollars that I paid for, because it was definitely less than five, uh, <coughs> Let's just put it that way. Um, the wife and I enjoyed it for what it was, but she kind of tuned down on it a little bit before I did. I do think it does tend to stay just a little too long. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. This movie is a, a solid 15 minutes too long. Yeah, but that last 15 minutes was the part that I was really, really enjoying. And I think, well, we'll, we'll get into it when we really start talking about it, but I think that the reason that she didn't enjoy this one as much as the... Mila Jovovich ones that she was more of a fan of was essentially you kind of need to know more about the video games for this one to really resonate with you. Whereas the Mila Jovovich ones, the less you know about the video games, the more they will resonate with you. You know, it's interesting because I posed that very question um, in the Discord 
because somebody had said uh I, I was talking about this movie i was like you know this is pretty good and uh travis in the discord how you doing travis uh thanks for <laughs> being my my subject of one in this experiment <laughs> But he had said, I've, I've never played any of the video games, but I kind of want to watch this movie. And I said, okay, report back and let me know what you think of that movie without any of the previous knowledge. And this is a direct quote from, from Travis. Uh, I thought the new Resident Evil movie was pretty good. I didn't recognize most of the references or names except from the other movies. But it was pretty obvious that they were there for the people that played the games. But I will say that was better than most of the other movies. And I think that is probably right um in terms of like if you've never played any of the games and i have like i'm a big fan of resident evil one and two in particular which this is a movie that puts those two games in a blender and whips them together and there there's your movie yeah it's basically a sorbet of those first two games and it also digs into the remakes a little bit for some of the stuff and then also includes some things that got cut out of the games but yeah. then, then makes enough changes to where if you didn't know shit about the games, you could still follow along. Yeah, it's right. You can you can navigate the story because the story is really simple and stupid. But it definitely takes a lot of shots directly from the games, especially that Resident Evil 2 remake. And Johannes Roberts is pretty upfront about that, where he said, hey, I really like this video game. I think it's incredibly cinematic. Capcom basically opened the warehouse to us and so we were like okay well we're gonna put this scene in the movie and this scene in the movie and then we're gonna have a liquor and then we're gonna do this and you know like the the uh truck driver that the scene uh opening with him uh with the half-eaten cheeseburger totally from the game you know just like directly lifted from that cinematic yeah the uh accident that he has is pretty much shot for shot they just spread it out a little bit mm -hmm. and they made it to where he's bringing claire into town instead of him just coming into town messing up with the cheeseburger hitting the lady and then causing the accident right in front of the cop station like that sure yeah and there's not the gooey eyed dog behind him like go ahead crash the truck though the reason the dog's there is they wanted to have the dog in the movie obviously they yep. wanted to have one of the flayed dog things that are always in the games but they didn't know how to bring it in so they just put it in the truck yeah that is one of the bigger problems of the movie is that i criticize movies like uh, th this is the hypocrite episode for me where i criticize movies all the time for being a member berry movie of like that kind of uh, uh, Ghostbusters Afterlife uh, kind of thing of like, hey, remember this from the movie you like. And this is not quite that. It's next door where it's like, remember this from the game you like. And it doesn't necessarily sit easily alongside all the other pieces of the movie, but I'm like, you guys, that's totally the dog. You guys, <laughs> look, they're picking dragonfly wings off that dragonfly, just like in Resident Evil 3. <laughs> yeah, was that the Alexander twins that they were yeah. showing or whatever? Yeah. yeah. Um, the thing that I was really interested in and the thing that I really found kind of interesting was that they brought um, the Liz Trainer character in, I think is what her name is, uh, the one with the sack on her head and the oh, half face. Mask. Lisa, Lisa Trevor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Lisa Trevor. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Um, so Lisa Trevor is a character that apparently was cut out of the original PS1 version uh -huh. of Resident Evil, and then they put her back into the remake, if I've read that. I have never yeah. played the remakes. Um, my love of Resident Evil, or my playing of Resident Evil, goes with just one and two, specifically, which is why I felt I should probably talk to you about this movie because of all the little references that I picked up. Um, the, the look of the police station is almost exactly to how it is in like Resident Evil 1. And the guy who plays, is it Jody, I think is the guy's name? Um, the cop that always has the really bad stance in the game, whenever he goes into a shooting stance and it's like he just spreads his legs like super wide and then you have to direct him up and around. Like mm. that guy with the sleeves. No, he's, he's Resident Evil 2, that character in Resident Evil 2 that has like the shitty stance in the game that always looks stupid. Yeah, like, Leon, he, yeah, 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 yeah. Leon, Leon, that's it. Leon does that fucking stance like he does in the game. Yeah. Well, like, and they're wearing the same clothes and uh, the, the big difference, uh, like one, uh, one thing I read was, oh, early on this was poorly received because the people 
in the movie and when the trailer was revealed that some of the characters didn't look like the characters in the game and it's like are you out of your mind like i understand if you want to pick nits and be like well it doesn't look exactly like the person from the game but in terms of how they're wardrobed and and that kind of thing it's like this is totally like yes you're not getting a one-to-one like they did not force these actors to undergo plastic surgery to fully look like the characters from the game or they didn't hire with that in mind but in terms of just having the kind of vibe like you said the stance and stuff like that it's like this was made by somebody who clearly loved the resident evil video games yeah like the main cinematic from resident evil one that like everybody like the original resident evil one that like everybody i think they used it to sell the game because that was like like the thing because it's like the first cinematic so they just kind of used it to sucker you in but it's the the one where the zombies eating that dude's neck and they come up on him with the flashlights mm-hmm. and the zombie gets up and turns his head. I mean, other than the fact that it's like not super pixelated, it looks almost exactly like it. Absolutely. One of the featurettes on the Blu-ray uh, that, again, has no director's commentary is some of that side-by-side stuff of like, oh, here's here's the video game, here's the movie, and it is almost identical at times. And it's... Uh, you know, for better or worse, if you don't like the video games, like, eh, you're probably not going to get as much out of this movie. Maybe nothing out of this movie. But if you do, and I, I, I'm like you, like I've played, I haven't played all the way through the remakes, but I've played some of both of the remakes, but I played the hell out of especially Resident Evil 2. And one of my fondest memories of playing any video game is me and a buddy of mine playing through resident evil 2 when we were in college and handing the controller back and forth it was because it's a single player game obviously but it was one of those things of like okay we're gonna play till you die and then when you die you're gonna hand the controller to me and i'm gonna play till i die but we were playing you know kind of on the couch and and watching the game unfold and one of (laughs) one of the things i remember best is there is a, a bit in the game where you have to kill a big alligator in the sewers and we just like both of us died a couple of times we just couldn't figure out how the hell to you know kill this thing like we're filling it with bullets and trying to flamethrower and all this stuff and then finally i can't remember if it was brian or me but one of us said hey there's a fire extinguisher on that wall when the the alligator comes out see if you can interact with that and make the alligator chew on the you know like a whole jaws thing right yeah yeah and that's totally. and that's totally how you killed it and so as soon as you interact with the fire extinguisher like the character throws the fire extinguisher at the alligator it starts chewing on it and i remember standing up and pointing at the screen and saying shoot that motherfucker and blew up the alligator it was so fun it was like just a joyous moment of video gaming where uh we had banged our head against the wall just long enough that it felt completely satisfying and so yeah i have a lot of fondness for for those first two games and yeah and so i was kind of predisposed like this i've had this conversation with a number of people that if you like those games and before there was ever a Resident Evil movie, before that first Mia Jovovich movie, this is the movie you thought you were going to see. Or at least we're hoping you could get. Yeah. Yeah. And instead, the Mia Jovovich movies just became its own thing. Like, Paul W.S. Anderson took that franchise for a ride, to be sure. Yeah, he made it the Matrix with zombies, basically, is what that series was. Yeah, and it's... Like I said, it's been. I know you said you're absolutely going back uh, through um, <laughs> th- those films, which I can't condone. But yeah. I, I'm not going to try to talk you out of it. <laughs> well, I'm already. I'm already like, as of this recording, I did one and two before I watched Raccoon City, just so I had sort of a baseline on. Okay, I want to remember what it felt like the first time I watched these two Resident Evil movies before I go back and watch Raccoon City, and I wanted to see if that would sort of pepper or, you know, just give it a little extra spice for this watch for Raccoon City. Because I I don't want to say that I didn't enjoy it, but I was a little underwhelmed by it, but it had so much of the fan service that I was hoping it would do, and all of these scenes that there were so many moments where I was pointing at the screen and looking like that 
that meme of Leonardo DiCaprio with the beer pointing at mm -hmm. the screen, <laughs> you know, where I'm like trying to like explain to my wife, I'm like, oh my God, that's like right in the middle of, you know, like this cinematic for game one. And I'm like, oh, that truck crash, that's almost exact. And the way it lands right in front of the police station. <laughs> uh, the itchy tasty thing that's in the, the diary thing that you have to read in the first game yeah. as you're reading the journal, where they talk about how they're itchy all over. And then they talk about how they've actually like broke down and ate someone and they were tasty. And then the last entry is just written in blood, itchy, period, tasty, mm -hmm. period. And you're like, oh God. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll tell you. All right, so let, let's get into the movie proper because we're kind of dancing around this. But one of the first thing you see, uh, and obviously we're not going scene by scene for a movie like this. We'll just kind of speak in, in kind of general terms about the plot. Still, spoilers nonetheless, if you haven't seen Resident Evil, Wac welcome to Rac Raccoon City. Resident Evil, Raccoon City. Um, <laughs> if you haven't seen Resident Evil, welcome to Raccoon City and haven't played the first two video games, uh, because if you have done either of those things, none of this was going to sound like a spoiler. But uh, if, if you want to approach this a, a little more fresh than you know watch the movie it's uh available on amazon and voodoo and apple and all that stuff for about five or six bucks so um you can get this legally at a very reasonable price <laughs> yes you can get it legally at a very reasonable price yes and um <laughs> i mean, look i i always as somebody who makes some money off of royalties i will never tell someone to uh if, if a movie is readily available that's how you should consume it um and also all those resident evil movies the the old mia jovovich ones uh, apparently are on hbo max so that is probably a thing i am going to, i'm probably gonna do that stream lounge thing for resident evil if that's the case um at any rate just on the day this drops look look for that to happen that night um okay anywho so uh yeah so it opens this was the point i was going to make it opens on the raccoon city orphanage and you've got uh chris and claire redfield who are kids the this uh I, I assume this is around like 1985 ish 1988 because uh, 1998 is the 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 body of the film but this is a flashback from that so they are living in this orphanage um and one of the first things you see is this nurse sitting behind a desk watching some sitcom and on the wall behind her is an advertisement for first aid spray yeah that's a total callback right there Absolutely. that's a nice police trick yeah. yeah i mean that was the first moment where i was like oh you don't say welcome to raccoon city that's the kind of movie we're gonna be all right let's see where you go with this but yeah so they uh there's as you mentioned there's this girl lisa trevor who is this mutant girl um who is basically dressed in doll masks made of human flesh by all accounts or at least that's what it's made to look like yeah yeah and so claire ends up seeing her a bunch and um also you know, let's not bury the lead. Again, spoilers for this discussion of the plot. Um, there's Neil McDonough, who is a wonderful character actor, been in all kinds of movies, always a pro, always brings it. I like him a lot. Um, he plays Dr. William Birkin, who works for the Umbrella Corporation that essentially runs the town. And the whole setup is in the modern context that umbrella is pulling out of this town it is and like taking all the jobs with it and is basically going to turn this place into a ghost town and he's one of the last you know uh, medical uh corporate types there to sort of you know turn the lights off and lock the doors and um he also was there at this orphanage and as it will happen court is doing some nefarious experiments on these children which is why lisa trevor is a mutant i like the idea that they put into this with um each of these facilities being sort of a secret 
um, front for, you know, genetic testing operation or whatever. And they find like ways to experiment on kids by having an orphanage. So they just snag them. Right. Um, that's very much like the games. That's more the remakes, I think, where they have like the orphanage and stuff. That's a front for genetic testing, isn't it? I, I don't remember. Like my memory of the remakes is that's a little shoddy just because I think it's the remake two is where the orphanage is more prominent. The yeah. remake of two is where the orphanage is prominent. I think. I may, I may just not have gotten that far into into that game. I, you know, when I played the remake, it was like, oh my god, look at how good the police department looks. Um, <laughs> yeah, and so we once we establish. Also, uh, Claire's a bit of a pill, uh, even as a young child, and Chris seems to be much more the the institutional guy. Like he believes Doctor Birkins you know stories about like hey i love all you kids equally there's no way i would ever experiment on any of you and yeah chris looks like he likes to lick boots even at this age yeah yeah that's why he becomes a cop and <laughs> then we we kind of bounce forward to 1998 where claire who has been away from raccoon city for a long time is coming home in the semi truck as we mentioned earlier with uh uh this truck driver and his doberman and yeah and and so the umbrella company uh is, is pulling out just devastating this town and while the truck driver is putting the moves on claire he all well not almost he hits a woman walking across the road and they get out and he's like oh my god oh my god oh my god my insurance doesn't cover any of this and sure enough though this woman just gets up and walks away which Claire finds a little unusual, Court. <laughs> and the dog also wanders over because we need to have a split dog that's infected. So he starts lapping up some of the zombie guts that were on the ground. Yeah, yeah. And so Claire comes back into town. Then we're, we're introduced to Leon Kennedy, who is one of the main characters that you can play. It's him and, and Claire in uh, part two. two. Yeah. And Leon Kennedy, the, the setup for the character in the movie, I don't even remember in the game that they go this far to set the character up other than he's kind of a rookie police officer. But he had shot somebody. With, shitty shooting, with a shitty shooting stance. Yeah, right. <laughs> I love the fact that he never gets better at it no matter how much he shoots the whole way through the game, just by the way. Yeah, uh, well, he get, he gets his hero moment at the end, so that's cool. Um, that's fair. But... He goes to the diner, like he wakes up kind of hungover. It's a real, uh, you know, uh, Die Hard with a Vengeance kind of vibe. And oh, I was thinking, I was thinking cuffs, but you know, just because he's kind of a Christian Slater mode when he wakes up. I get, yeah, I guess you're right. That is more cuffs than Die Hard with a Vengeance because he shakes this hangover off pretty quick. <laughs> so he he goes to this diner where we also meet uh, Jill Valentine and Albert Wesker, who are from the first game. And in this case, they're cops. And Jill Valentine, a uh, bit of a sharpshooter. Um, and Albert Wesker, bit of an asshole, uh, which is consistent through the games. And While they may not look exactly as they are supposed to look in the games, the spirit of the characters are portrayed really well by both of these actors. Yeah, um, especially Jill. The lady who plays Jill is amazing. Yeah, yeah. Um, and one thing Leon notices as he's about to, you know, they take off and give him some shit for being a rookie and whatnot. And as Leon is leaving, he notices that the waitress is uh, leaking some blood from one eye like you do. And he's like, hey, you may want to get somebody to take a look at that. And she's like, oh, I guess I'm fine. Huh, everything's weird. And so <laughs> he takes off for the police station while Claire goes home, or not her home, but Chris's home, picks the lock, uh, which no one ever says the line, which is probably for the best. But the line that you are kind of waiting on here is that she is the master of all unlocking. <laughs> But, Although he does kind of hint at it when he talks about it was like the deadbolt uh, pin or something like that. And he's like, you can't, how can you even pick something like that? He does say. Yeah, they, they 
nod to it, but they don't say the line because it is one of mm, one of my top five favorite bad translations in video games. <laughs> uh, but anyway, yeah, so she picks a lock, goes inside. Chris is on his way to the police station. Well, the and... neighbor was all freaky looking, so she doesn't just pick the lock to go inside. The neighbor freaked her out, so she picked the lock to go inside. Right, right, right. Like, starting to... Uh, and one of the things that uh, Johannes Robert said is that especially in the early going of these people turning into you know flesh eating ghouls that he wanted it to almost have a radiation sickness vibe so that they're really pale and their hair's falling out and they're you know you see lesions on their skin and that kind of thing which I think looks really good like there's some good practical effects in this there are some not so good digital effects but there are some good practical effects going on in this movie I did like that 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 change that they did were the, to look like radiation sickness because the look of them generates more empathy for me personally mm -hmm. than they're just fine one minute and the next they're just this grayish dead thing with their eyes all glazed over. The fact that they're slowly decaying and their hair's falling out and you just see how horribly they're suffering. Yeah. Um, I think that draws more empathy um, than just the way that they change, say, in the Milo Jovovich once. Right, yeah, for sure, yes. And, you know, after kind of seeing those people, and this is also where you get the itchy, tasty thing. It's the woman next door that writes that on the door. Um, but Claire ends up telling Chris, like, hey, the reason I came back is because I've been talking to this weirdo who lives in Raccoon City named Ben Bertolucci. And conspiracy theorist Ben Bertolucci says that the Umbrella Corporation is hightailing out of town because they have been steadily poisoning the water over years and years. And they've got to basically pull up stakes to like save the lives of their employees and whatnot. And they're just getting out of Dodge while the getting's good. And Chris, ever the inst institutionalist, believes that that's all bullshit. You know. I did like that she talks about how she was chatting with him on a chat room and because it's 98, Chris has no idea what that is. And I was like, what the fuck's a chat room? Yeah. Or whatever. Yeah, yeah, that is pretty good. And But so a siren goes off that's like, hey, everybody in Raccoon City, stay in your homes. Everything's cool. Just stay inside. Trust us. And <laughs> so he's like, oh, I got to go. That sounds like police business. And so he takes off and then... Uh, the kid from next door breaks into the house with Claire inside and uh, anyway Claire goes to look for the kid and the kid is like you know you need to save yourself and then out comes the mother and the mother is just like it's not quite that first stage of the bleeding of the eyes it's a little bit past that where she's starting to just lose her mind and become dangerous and it's pretty good. I like all this stuff. Like the the first like mm, 20, 30 minutes of this movie, I think are, are totally good. Yeah, it has a solid beginning. It totally does. I do not disagree. Uh, and I like when she actually goes and does the beeline run at her looking mm -hmm. all monstrous. I love that you actually can hear her like kind of growling itchy tasty at her as they're wrestling on the floor and stuff. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's good stuff. And then... <laughs> Then we go to the police station where the stars team, which is more of a Resident Evil three designation, but uh, I'm not going to, I'm not going to get all up in arms about that. Um, they end up meeting chief irons who is played by Donal Logue in this movie, who you will know from movies like blade two or not blade two, but the original blade. Sorry. And uh, what else has he been in? He's been a bunch of stuff. That's what I, uh, I I tend to think of him from. Yeah, he had a turn as a really awful character in Sons of Anarchy, but he's been in a ton of movies oh, right. and stuff. Basically, this is Donald Logue's bread and butter. You hire him when you need a guy that's kind of creepy and makes you feel like something's going to be really, really wrong every minute he's on screen. But then he doesn't really do anything. He's just there to make you feel creeped out. And yeah. The character he's playing in the... In the video games, isn't he like a fucking serial killer? Or it's implied that he's a serial killer. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. And th yeah, in the movie, he's more of just a sarcastic jerk. He's just a typical police captain. He's just basically being every Donald Logue character that Donald Logue has ever done. Yeah. 
And he ends up sending Alpha Team to go check on Bravo Team, who was supposed to go to the Spencer Mansion and see what was going on. And they never reported back. So Chris Redfield and Jill Valentine and Wesker, uh, along with, you know, Officer Eats a Lot and (laughs) Officer Haircut are going uh, to to check out the mansion. You forgot about Officer Zombie Fodder. Yeah, absolutely. And meanwhile, Wesker finds a... Um, like a PDA uh, in his locker that's like, hey, everything you need to know is on this PDA. Uh, don't don't tell anybody, but you're a spy. And so they take off and helicopter to the Spencer Mansion, leaving Leon Kennedy and the chief there. And <laughs> Leon is basically, because he's a rookie, is left behind just to make sure nothing explodes. Which, of course, something is about to. Yeah, of course it's going to explode because he's the one that's left in charge. Right. So, uh, sure enough, the truck driver who has is now a, a completely zombified because his zombified dog bit him, um, crashes his truck, which explodes at the beginning or at the entrance of the raccoon police department, which is this incredible Gothic building. And the, the, the truck driver completely on fire wanders into the police station. This is probably the best CG. And if they, there's no way they did that practically because that's way too much goddamn fire. It's really good though. And you're right. Good. Like fire is really hard to do with CG. That's why I wanted to mention it because I was impressed with how good they made this look. Yeah, absolutely, because the fire exploding into the station when the truck crashes, not so great, but the, this shot is very good. And I don't know how they did it. The guy looks like he's walking around as an inferno. Yeah, it's fun. And so Donal Logue shoots him in the head, and he's like, well, I'm out of here. And there's a great line, maybe my favorite line of the movie, where Leon Kennedy says, well, who's in charge then? And, he, and Donald Logue says, well, you are. You can uh, be sure to give your father a call and tell him how his gigantic disappointment of a son is really rocketing up the ladder here at the Raccoon City Police Department. And so he takes off, leaving Leon Kennedy presumably alone. And uh, But let's leave that there for the moment and cut back to the mansion where there is uh the helicopter arrives they find a couple of the, they find the the police car and some blood but they don't find the officers and haircut says oh i think they went this way towards the mansion <laughs> so they go to the mansion and then wesker and jill end up taking off together and then uh chris redfield and haircut go off together Whisker actually is the one that suggests they split up so that he can take his spying on pilot and go to his spying gear. Right, because he basically goes up to this music room where, again, if you've ever played the video game, you play uh, the Moonlight Sonata and this secret passage opens up. And Jill is like, what the, how did you know to, to do that? And he's like, well, it's a little complicated. And before uh, she can get a satis- uh, satisfying answer out of him, the helicopter uh, crashes into the building on account of the helicopter pilot having been bitten by a zombie but still took off and then, you know, started a zombie out in in midair and crashes into the mansion. The helicopter crash into the mansion isn't in any of the games, is it? I don't remember. There is, I, I believe there's a helicopter crash, but I, I don't believe that's in one. And I don't think it ever is in the mansion proper. So yeah, I think there's some limits. And, yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm fine with how they did it because it adds to the danger. And I think those effects were actually pretty decent. Mm-hmm. And I, I like the way that they, they did that. And it felt like something that they would have inserted into one of the games. I mean, when you have to fight an alligator in the sewer, you know, it's like this giant mutated alligator in a sewer in a video game. It's not outrageous that a helicopter would crash 
into a room to keep you from getting the information you need to move further into the story. <laughs> oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The right. It, like all of this feels tonally right, even if the the plot kind of bounces all over the place, and I don't know that any of the storylines has a particularly satisfying payoff. Regardless, I think that all of this feels like it belongs in the movie, even if it doesn't all add up to much. Um, or, it, or it doesn't add up to anything that it, like is consistent. Like No one is ever going to mistake this for being a classic horror film or anything. But it looks right, and it sounds like and it sounds right, and all of these pieces, like the the helicopter crashing into the building and stuff, like that fits alongside the truck crashing and all of that. Like it feels like you're doing these parallel stories. And at at this point, Wesker tells Jill, like, "Oh, I've been hired to get all the secrets of the Umbrella Corporation, and so we're going to use this secret passage to steal." the virus that they have been working on from Dr. Uh, Birkin. And uh, he ends up like Jill gets attacked by a zombie and he saves her. And then he fucks off into the tunnels to go after this virus. And uh, meanwhile, uh, Chris and haircut find the resident evil one zombie in the hallway. Yeah. And it's perfect. <laughs> absolutely like again if there hadn't been the paul ws anderson resident evil movies this is the resident evil movie that you would have expected to see where they absolutely do this shot and it's really good it's really good i like it a lot i'm a sucker for it uh I, you know I've, i'll i'll detail my complaints with the movie here in a few but at this moment, when I'm watching this movie and I see this particular shot, I'm like, that is what this movie should be. I'm glad they were doing this. And it's, it's kind of funny. My wife not playing the video games herself, that scene still pops for her too. Because the creep factor of what they establish in the games before they get up to attack you and you have to defend yourself in that cinematic is still there. It still works on that level too. Yeah, for sure. And so... Uh, Chris Redfield um, and Haircut are beset by zombies. Haircut gets eaten. Chris Redfield uh, battles a bunch of them. Ultimately, Jill Valentine shows back up and saves him. And she's like, hey, by the way, there's this secret passage in the mansion that Wesker went in. If we can get to that, I think we can get out of here. And so they're off to do that. And so we will leave them there and go back to the city proper where Chief Irons is trying to get out of the city, but is stopped because the police slash military have completely sealed off Raccoon City and aren't letting anybody in or out. And if you try to get out, they'll shoot you. And that's how you know that things have taken a real turn south in your hometown. Oh, and the soldiers that are the, they're like a, a type of special tactical unit, the security force or whatever it is that the Umbrella Corporation, they show up in the games too, exactly like that, gas masks and all. Yeah. And so Chief Irons goes back to the station where he is immediately attacked by the zombie dog, but Claire Redfield shows up at the last minute and kills the zombie dog with a fire extinguisher. You think that was maybe a wink and a nod to the alligator? Maybe. Maybe I wouldn't put it past. I mean, like this movie is filled like it, there's even stuff in the mansion where you see like green herbs and blue herbs sitting on uh, like as pot potted plants in the background and that kind of thing. Like it's yep. if, if it is in the video game, it is like uh, what's another thing? Uh, Jill Valentine saying what would be worse to be what eaten by a shark or a giant snake? Which are references to two of the things that you find in the basement of the mansion in Resident Evil 1. And, <laughs> you know... Oh, when she steals the sandwich in the diner, she says it's now a Jill sandwich, which was a reference to her almost getting smashed mm -hmm. in one of the rooms or something like that. Yeah, it's... I mean, it's just chock full of that kind of stuff that, you know... Again, it's memberberry stuff, but if you're doing a Resident Evil movie, that is what you want to see in a Resident Evil movie. I think in a video game adaptation, 
because that's who you're really making it for mostly is the people that would play the video game that want a member berry playing the video game without doing the work yeah uh, absolutely right 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 and, and that's why i don't have as big a problem uh, I think with a video game adaptation making all of these reference to the references to the video games because if you didn't play the games that's not necessarily going to land with you but if you did it's a little bit of a like oh my god they shed the thing and once again Leonardo DiCaprio pointing at the screen meme that's me the whole way through a yeah. lot of this stuff uh, yeah yeah it's it, I mean it's crazy that it's that it's that layered into the movie and to the point that I think, cause I, as, as we talked about uh, before and as my test subject of one Travis confirmed, like that was my big concern when I watched this movie was if you didn't play these games, is this all just nonsense? And the answer is, even if you did play the game, it's kind of nonsense, but <laughs> it, it's a uh, spoiler alert. Everybody, the games were kind of nonsense for their stories too. You just went along with it because you had fun. Right. Yeah. And, and I think that's kind of the, the vibe here. Um, but yeah, so Claire kills the zombie dog. Leon pulls a gun on her. And um, so we, we hook up with those two. They end up going to an armory uh, inside the police station to get some weapons. And then we realize, oh, the guy that Claire has been in chat rooms with, Ben Bertolucci, is... The fuck's a chat room? Right. Oh man. Oh, if only we had pulled back the stick at that point. <laughs> if it just been like chat rooms was as far as the internet ever developed, what a what a much better world this would be. They were already toxic by ninety eight too. Yeah, but it was still limited. Like if you still just had chat rooms and you didn't have like it was still just little pockets of weirdness as opposed to like just Twitter, you know? right right <laughs> like if, if there were no social media platforms is what i'm getting at like that's the thing that needed to have been stopped i could <laughs> i don't if i could travel back in time i would not kill hitler i would kill zuckerberg <laughs> well he stole the idea from some other folks before whatever <laughs> like, myspace I, and shit was there too if i if i gotta take out the guy who made the first ibm computer whatever it, it should have been stopped. There is a grand social experiment being conducted and nobody knows the results. <laughs> um, hey, that's fair. That's fair. Look what social media has done. It's turned us all into the radiated zombies of Resident Evil. Welcome to rock. Kind of <laughs> like, have you read like any study about what it does to children? It's horrifying what social media does to people. Anyway, uh, <laughs> well, that's not what we're, here, what we're here to talk about. Um, but yeah, so Ben Bertolucci is asking to be let out, but then a zombie eats him and then Leon and Claire and Chief Irons are like, Hey, we got to get the hell out of here. We're going to go to the orphanage where we, Lisa Trevor is waiting to show them the, a secret tunnel that will lead them, you know, under the building and kind of out to safety. And so we get a, a shot of the liquor here. One of those kills uh, Chief Irons. Um, and Lisa Trevor kills the liquor. And this was bad, CG. The liquor looked terrible. It, it The zombie dog is maybe the worst, but the liquor does not look very good either. The liquor does not look substantially better than the one in the Paul W.S. Anderson movie, and that doesn't look very good either. It's almost like... The liquor looks exactly like it did in the video game. Like he just went there and did that. Yeah. Like the CG's almost as bad as a PlayStation One liquor, <laughs> or PlayStation, yeah, PlayStation One liquor from like Resident Evil Two, right? Yeah. <laughs> and the same thing with the dog. Like the dog looked kind of pixelated. Like he almost went, well, we can't really afford to go crazy, so let's just make it look like it did in the game. Yeah, it's a little too good for for it to be a direct reference, but it certainly is more in line with a PlayStation 2 than, say, Jurassic Park. It, on the scale of, hey, that looks like a video game to dinosaurs are real, this is much closer to that looks like a video game. Yeah, yeah, and there's even some shots where um, they're not really, like, digitally de-aging people, but some of the looks on the faces of the people have some uncanny valley mm -hmm. to where... It almost 
It almost feels like they kind of went a little too much with the glossy and blur <laughs> in post production. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For some of it, because like some of the skin is like just a little too smooth, and there's a couple of moments where, particularly Claire and Leon, I mean, and that just might be because they're both really pretty people, mm -hmm. but there's some real uncanny valley moments with their eyes where it feels kind of almost like um, Alita Battle Angel, where the eyes are just too big. <laughs> at some points where like it just doesn't look right i don't i don't know how else to describe it but there's just some of the shots that were like that where it was a little extra blurry and like like they were trying to emulate a video game look a little too much in some of those shots yeah it's for me it's like watching the polar express or something where it's like I, you're going for a level of fidelity with with these graphics that you're just missing a hair and that difference in success and failure is that it makes my eyes hurt and my brain bleed <laughs> that's why i still can't watch that movie it just horrifies me um yeah like like we were talking about uncanny valley is a great way to put it but they're actual actors and they're not being augmented by cg it's just something that they did in the shot that made them look a little bit off. I noticed it in a couple of different spots. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. But there are also, some of these zombies too are just, you know, straight up makeup effects and all that stuff looks really good. So yeah, the practical effects that are there are excellent, particularly on all of the people. Yeah, yeah. It's it's really, uh, really in impressive. Um, so at any rate, uh, Wesker, back to Wesker, he is traveling uh, through this passage trying to find Dr. Birkin, and he finds Dr. Birkin along with Dr. Birkin's wife and kid. And Wesker is like, hey, I don't want to have to murder all of you, so how about you just hand me the virus, and then we'll all take off. And um, Dr. Birkin is like, yeah, okay, I'll give it to you. But he has a gun hidden, and then Wesker and Dr. Birkin end up shooting each other. And Birkin is dying. Wesker is also in not great shape. But then uh, the, the daughter actually ends up killing him. Because she grabs the gun that her father had. And uh, Wesker, you know, points the gun at her, and she just you know, throws down <laughs> on him, pulls iron and shoots him. And, um, but not before Wesker shoots the wife. It's a real like tombstone moment where everybody's shooting everybody. And that was weird because the wife is supposed to be, um, a geneticist or working like a scientist as well in the games. And then I know the daughter guns up getting loose and ends up hooking up with Jill, um, or Claire, the second one i'm getting my games confused now at some point as well but like i thought that both of the the couple here were both um scientists working on behalf of umbrella and she was off doing something else while he was getting the stuff in the games Does that sound about right yeah i think that's right that sounds right that sounds like something that could happen for sure <laughs> i'm sorry i'm just i'm going by my memory from like years and years ago of playing the game but i remember the wife being a scientist too and just having her get killed here was kind of disappointing for me because i remember her definitely having more to do with stuff than this yeah so um yeah it, at any rate everybody gets murdered in this scene except for the daughter <laughs> she gets away I guess it's she's got a low center of gravity and she's smaller and a harder target target to hit. Right. She's wily. And um it also turns out that Wesker, not Wesker, sorry, Dr. Birkin to save himself because he's dying injects himself with the G virus. And uh then Birkin starts to mutate um Chris and Jill Valentine start to run away from him and then Claire and Leon show up in the same tunnels and so they're trying to shoot him and so now we've got Claire Leon Jill Valentine, Chris Redfield and the little girl, the doctor's girl and so they finally, uh, they shoot up Dr. Burke and Monster a few times and then jump in a train 
uh, underground to get away. But lo and behold, the monster that is now way less Dr. Birkin and more just a giant mutant creature. Um, Complete with the giant eyeballs and the arms like the end of the end monster of Resident Evil 2, right? Right. And again, like Resident Evil 2, it rips off like the top of this train and um, Leon shows up with a rocket launcher and blows the shit out of it. And also one of the worst like CGI moments of the <laughs> movie. That does not look great because I don't know what kind of science is being applied here. Like I know there's G viruses and zombies and all kinds of stuff. So it's not realism that we're going for, but if a rocket launcher grenade explodes within 30, 40 feet of you, I think that turns your pancreas into jelly. Yeah. The concussion damage that that can do to you is still quite severe just from the explosive blast alone. Um, but it looked cool. <laughs> yeah, I guess. Um, so at any rate, uh, it blows up and then there's a big shockwave as the entire town explodes because the Umbrella Corporation is trying to cover their tracks. And uh, as our survivors, you know, basically walk out of the tunnel away from Raccoon City and presumably to safety... Um, you get a little bit of like computer text on the screen that's like, you know, Raccoon City completely destroyed, survivors zero. Uh, presuming that uh, the Umbrella Corporation does not realize that these people have made it out to safety. And um, then uh, we get a post credits uh, scene. Court, it's uh, everybody's favorite character shows up for two seconds. Where <laughs> Ada Wong. Yeah. Where uh, Wesker wakes up in a body bag and he he is blinded by the light. So she throws him the patented Wesker sunglasses that he puts on. And she it turns out she was the one who sent him uh, to get all of this information. And he says, well, who are you? And she says, Ada Wong. And everybody in the audience, uh, by which I mean me on my couch, you know, and clapped. Yeah, clapped my Dorito stained fingers together, just like, oh my god, it's Ada Wong! Um, and that's it. That's that's a movie that you are probably never going to see a sequel to, despite the sequel setup. Like, it made it, mm, did it make money? It probably just about broke even, which is not exactly how uh, you, you want it to go if you're starting a new Resident Evil franchise. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, I think it was made for about 25 million. I think globally it took in about 45. So if you assume, you know, marketing is double the budget or equal to the budget, then it costs about $50 million to get this movie out. Only made about 45. Eh. Unless it just blows up on home video. This is probably the last that we're going to see of the you know, Johannes Roberts averse of uh, <laughs> Resident Evil. Well, that was going to be so ridiculous to try and pronounce anyway, so. Right. But, all right, so that's the plot. Let's talk about the cast. Um, I know you said that you really liked uh, Hannah John Kamen as Jill Valentine. The uh, lady who plays Claire was... Kaya really uh, Scodelario? Scodelario, yeah. yeah. I liked her in Crawl. I thought she was great in that as mm -hmm. the the swimmer who goes to save her dad in the middle of a hurricane. <laughs> like that, I thought that was. A, I actually liked Crawl, so I, I dug it. Um, and I thought she was great in that. Um, I'm a fan of the guy who plays Wesker in this because of Umbrella Academy. And when he showed up, my wife made the joke of, "Hey." Uh, does this guy only show up in movies and TV shows with umbrellas in it? He was in Game of Thrones. I know, I'm just being, you know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, he was also he was also in Terminator Dark Fate, really? All right. Whatever you say, IMDb. Um, yeah, I think, I think he's a pretty good actor, and uh, he's actually transcended just being a giant man, mm -hmm. you know, because he plays a lot of characters based on the fact that he's just big. But in this film, he branches out a little bit and does a little bit more. Um, 
I think the big thing that we remember him from was uh, Black Sails. He was Billy Bones. Ah, okay. I, I'm as I pointed out, I'm a big Neil McDonough fan who plays Dr. Burke, and and he has been in everything. Uh, every every TV show, every movie, he has been in all of it. Um, he has been in Marvel stuff. He's been in schlocky, uh, like straight to to DVD Marine sequels. He he was a great villain on Justified. It, Ooh, it, one of the creepiest on Justified. Yeah, oh, he's incredible. And like the guy does like five or six movies a year. So um, he's just he, again, he's a working actor and he's a pro. He brings it every time. I've never seen him deliver a performance that that did not feel earnest in a movie. He is a consummate professional. And you know, and Donal Logue, he's he's fine in it, but uh, <laughs> he definitely leaves his teeth marks on the scenery out the door yeah when he when he finally goes because it's donald Logue. but the character that he's playing is a suspected serial killer in the games and how do you make someone be that creepy but not have them portray anything like that because maybe we'll reveal it in the next movie that that was the case we'll see but how, how do they set that up and make it believable? They just hire Donald Logan. You're not automatically think, Hey, that guy might be a serial killer. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. So he's good. I really, the only, and this is kind of damning with faint praise, but Robbie Amell, uh, who plays Chris Redfield, it's just one of those performances where you're like, this is the most vanilla yogurt performance that you could have in this role. Like he is completely forgettable. Um, I don't think he's bad. I just think that he doesn't leave a mark. Like, it, you know, Tom Hopper who plays Wesker, at least he gets to be kind of villainous and, and so forth. And, and there's that nice moment when he gets shot by the little girl where he's like, I would, I was never going to shoot you. Like I would not kill a little girl. And you're like, Oh, okay. Well, Wesker, you know, is kind of a one note villain in, um, the Paul W.S. Anderson movies and also kind of in the video game as well. So it's kind of nice to see him get a little bit of depth in in this film. Uh, but Hopper does a good job of actually portraying that as well. That's one of yeah. the things that he does get to branch out on. I forgot to mention that, but that was definitely like you can see that the guy has some chops beyond just being all brawn. Yeah, yeah. I, I think he's kind of one of the bigger surprises. And then there's uh, Avon Yogia, Yogia. Uh, who plays Leon Kennedy, who, much like Robbie Amell, I'm like, eh, he's fine, I guess, but I just don't have a lot of, uh, a lot of strong feelings one way, or the, one way or the other about that performance. It's just, it's very vanilla. Um, anybody else that you want to call out? That's, that's no. most of the performers. No, you pretty much have it nailed. Um, I do want to give credit to many of the zombie performers at the gate, um, as they're begging to be let in yeah. and the hair's falling out and everything. Like I was just, usually when you're playing the resident evil video games, you see the people that are infected and they're automatically disgusting and they look like something other and you just don't want to be around them. Those you felt sorry for, especially at the gate and the actors that are performing that the way that was shot with the rain coming down, the way the gate was slowly giving way, but they're all still so much in pain and confused and scared. Oh my god, that just was like total horror. That moment really worked for me. Yeah, yeah, that was, yeah, I, I agree. That that was a great moment. That woman looking at the hair that she's pulled out of her head, like, oh my god. Um, and then the rain slowly washes it away as yeah. she gets distracted again and just keeps being begged to let, like, begging to let in or get past the gate. Yeah, it's good. It's good. That stuff is really, really sells uh, in this movie. Um, all right, so let's talk about themes. Um, I'll I'll throw down what I think are the obvious ones, and then you tell me if I'm missing anything. Because I do think that, like, yes, this is a big schlocky mess of a movie, but there is the traditional, like, tampering with God's plan kind of theme. But also, there, and much like the video games, they have this too, but there is very much that idea of, you know a corporation is there to do what a corporation do. It doesn't care about the people 
in the town. It doesn't care about really its own employees. All that matters is the end result. And in this case, it's, um, you know, we need to retrieve the virus and also cover up our, our years of misdeeds. But, you know, and if we have to, you know, can't make an omelet without breaking a few eggs. And if those eggs happen to be innocent civilians, well, so be it. Yeah, I kind of like that they did it this time when they said it was like a water supply where it had been slowly, like the corporation had been slowly poisoning them because there are factories that the towns that they're based in and the people that work for the factories are also being slowly poisoned by the factories. Mm -hmm. And that, that type of practice actually still goes on in uh, like India and things like that. That does happen where they're living downstream of a polluted water from the factory that they're working in and are slowly being poisoned by the place that they work at. Yeah. Uh, so there is a um, corporatized greed um, also being where the cost of human life, because they do this, um, they, they, they talk about it in the game where the Umbrella Corporation talks about that there's various assets. There are like expendable assets. And even though the stars team, you know, may not be as expendable as others, they're still relatively expendable where it's like whoever survives the mission, they're going to lift them out because it's worth it to save who's left. But if they die while it's on the mission, well, we'll just get more stars, that kind of thing. But then they have like the corporate executives like Ada and everything and their assets that cannot be expendable and they're always taken out and rescued. And that's where a lot of these teams get sent in to do stuff is to rescue people like that in the games and everything like that. So I kind of like that they had that hierarchy where they were showing that a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, I thought that was kind of an interesting route to take it because like that kind of, that kind of like inner corporate minutia is, is not something that you would think would really translate well for storytelling, but they do it visually rather quickly in this movie. And they give you that sense without you really having to think about it too much. And the only reason that I'm bringing it up is because it's something that's on my mind when I play the video games because you're, everyone's expendable and human life is so cheap. And that irresponsibility of just the corporatized greed to just poison the people that they are depending on because they are just that much more expendable being just a factory worker or whatever they may be in Raccoon City, uh, that is prevalent and right out front the way that they say that the virus gets out this time. It's not just a lab leak. They've been intentionally or unintentionally poisoning this town over the years as an experiment. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I think it, that stuff kind of works, you know, like, um, it, it's easy. Like this, uh, this isn't, I think you're right that it does some things with, with a nice light touch, but in terms of, um, the general approach of like, it's, it's, it's fairly didactic as a movie. Like there's no there's not a whole lot of nuance in terms of like, well, you know, they were pursuing good ends, uh, but it just got out of control because that's the nature of bureaucracy or whatever. It's like, no, no, no. The Umbrella Corporation is evil. They're poisoning the water. They're experimenting on children. That's it. But, you know, it's still all right. Um, it's nice that the movie is saying something, which is better than nothing, you know? And that was sort of like... I. I guess you can kind of argue that the same thing is being said in those Paul W.S. Anderson movies, or at least the first one, but by movie number three, are those movies really about anything? No, movie number three is where they're already in the desert trying to survive an apocalypse Mad Max style. And yeah. And she's got the powers of the Matrix. So no, not at all. <laughs> right. So I, you know, I, and like I'm, again, this is a damning with faint praise kind of thing. I'm not giving the movie too much credit for being like overly smart or anything, but it's at least interesting, you know, like there, there is some substance to it besides, Oh my God, zombies. I get the sensation that the filmmakers for raccoon city or welcome to raccoon city. When they were throwing in the themes that they were trying to throw in, I think they were throwing in the stuff from the games specifically one and two that they absolutely loved and they wanted to make sure that that stuff was up front in center mm -hmm. so while it's completely unsubtle about everything it's so emulating the thing that it's being so completely unsubtle about that this subtle through line we're talking about with the 
corporate greed and how they slowly poison the people and all of that that, that that they've thrown in actually kind of works because it fits with what they're already doing with the game. Because the game basically said the same thing. It was just basically like a lab leak or just all of a sudden it's there. Yeah. <laughs> and they have to deal with it. But it was definitely this corporation's irresponsibility and they've been experimenting on people forever. And the games have always said corporation evil. Like mm -hmm. Umbrella has always been evil, you know, from the very start of the games. And it's an indictment of corporate culture altogether. And it always has been. So they have this whole gambit of stuff that they could play with. And I think as broad as they could have gone and as excessive as they could have gone with it, like say with miles and miles and miles of underground uh, facilities and like all of these bunkers and all of these ridiculous things that, you know, are just built up in like huge cities and all that stuff that the corporation does. They stick with the smaller town that was like sort of the, the founder built a mansion and then the rest of the town grew from there. And it looks so much like the actual game that you get the sensation that, yeah, they could make this town disappear. Like, there's no way you could make a giant city like Raccoon City disappear in, in the other films, but it fits, like, in this because it's a smaller town. And yeah, I believe a corporation could just say, yeah, some accident happened in this town that's secluded off here in the mountains named Raccoon City. We're real sorry about that. Yeah, it's right. It, 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 there is There is something there. Um... Okay, so let's let's start bringing this in for a landing here and talk about just kind of final thoughts, and then we'll rate the movie. Um, I'll give my final thoughts, but I'll rate it after you do yours because uh, you might change my mind. Um, <laughs> ultimately, I think it's a fun adaptation. I know I've already said this before as in, in our discussion, but like this is kind of the Resident Evil movie I always wanted to see. It's it's silly. It's you know. The CGI leaves something to be desired, but there's some practical effects that almost make up for all of that. Uh, the plotting is kind of dopey because you're trying to cram these two video games into this one story and you're not really like all the characters are really one note and and it's not like we're getting real drama in any of this. So it's not it's not a serious movie. You know what I mean? Like it's it's not a movie that you look at w through the lens of, of like serious cinema, but I think it's fun. I think it's a good time. It, it, it needs to be about 15 minutes shorter. It needs to be a little tightened up and get everybody together a little bit quicker, but it's all right. Uh, and that's kind of my, my final thoughts. What about you? I definitely enjoyed the movie. I will definitely say that. Um, it does meander quite a bit. Um, like, towards the middle uh it's kind of uneven the way it jumps back and forth between what's happening in the city for part two and what's happening in the mansion for part one um and it gets a little frustrating whenever they're doing that because they're trying to have their cake and eat it to two, eat it too in that sense of, you know where they're jumping back and forth and it kind of takes too long in both locations trying to build suspense mm -hmm. where they need to just kind of like you said get to the point that's definitely a downside for that to me uh the side-loaded sort of themes that are in the game of corporate greed and all of that kind of stuff that I talked about, I still feel that they definitely did very subtly, but they also found a way to bring in and show you just how evil Umbrella actually is. And they shortcutted it by having it do the changes that we talked about with uh, slowly poisoning the town over time. It makes it seem that much worse and horrific mm -hmm. <laughs> instead of like one quick accident. We were just being negligent. Oopsie. <laughs> you know? Um, I, I definitely really like, uh, I would say just about 85% of the movie and the stuff that I don't like on subsequent rewatches, I probably would just kind of skip through that, like, you know, that do kind of slow down so I can get to the parts that I definitely did really enjoy, like the gore and the practical effects. And we didn't really talk about it, but whenever the main baddie transforms, that's almost all 100% practical. Mm -hmm. I think even the eyeballs moving in his shoulders, some of them actually, they were augmented a little with CG, I think, but like some of them were actually practically moving in some of the scenes, which I thought was really good. And just the, just for the fact that they used the practical effects that they did and they looked as good as they did and they were actually there alone, it's definitely worth your time and it's worth the rental. 
or it's even worth owning. And if you're a fan of the video games and you slept on this one because you're like, oh my God, not a fucking another one because of all the Paul W.S. Anderson ones, this may be the one that you want to go to. And maybe if it's been super long since you checked out all the other ones, if you've never watched the or played the games before in your, your life and you just kind of want to dip your toe back into a Resident Evil feeling, this is definitely for you as well. There's There's stuff to be had and enjoyed here. It's not the greatest thing ever, but it is a perfect example of exploitation in that it is so much fan service for the video game fanatic and yet so fucking uh, cheeseball fun all at once. It's exactly what I want in a, you know, kind of exploitation flick. I think it's perfect for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I agree. Uh, yeah, okay. Um, and I would also add to your list of, of kind of fun effects moments. Uh, in the lab with Neil McDonough when they um, have the zombie opened up on the table and that zombie is real pathetic as well. And you're like, yeah. oh, that's kind of sad that that's the fate of this person is just to be this living dead thing, you know, opened up uh, on this surgical table. So, um, all right. So uh, scale of one to five. Um, half stars are allowed, no quarter stars. We're not monsters here. Uh, where do you land on Resident Evil? Welcome to Raccoon City. I'm going to say about a three and a half out of five. Um, it's not going into the four category for me because that has to be like a really good movie. Mm -hmm. You know, like five would be like excellent. You know, like I have no complaints. It would be basically a five. You know, and this one definitely for me, because I, I did have some issues here and there. I did feel the running time here and there, but I think it's definitely above average or midway, but it's not quite into the, you know, really good, like four categories. So that's why I think three, five, three point five is probably where I want to be. All right. I'm going to come in a little bit lower with a three, which is my way of saying it's hard to recommend because it's not a great movie, but I can also, it, it's got that big asterisk, right? Which is, hey, if you like these video games and you always wanted to see the adapt, the movie adapta adaptation of this, that isn't great, but it's kind of what you always wanted to see. That's what this movie is. And I've seen it like two and a half times now. Uh, as well as watch all the special features and everything. And the one thing I'll say is I don't think this was cynical. Like, I think that Johannes Roberts really wanted to make a good Resident Evil movie and made a pretty good Resident Evil movie in the attempt. I think that, you know, it's very clear that some of the sets are just green screened and, and things like that. And that's a bummer. But also, it looks like the video game. So if you just wanted to see a really high res version of the video game. That's kind of what this is. And, um, but yeah, it's, I don't want to oversell it, but also I enjoyed it. And there is definitely a world in which I would watch this again. Probably not alone. It would probably be in a situation, um, where I, I felt like I was, I, I was going to show it to somebody that liked the games I'm like, oh, okay, well, let's sit down and watch this because there, there's something to be had if that's the case. Um, so, uh, all right, let's, before we wrap things up here, Court, we like to leave the listeners feeling a little bit smarter. And <laughs> some things you may not have known about Resident Evil, welcome to Raccoon City. That is right. So here are three things that uh, you probably, probably did not know about Resident Evil Welcome to Raccoon City. One is that originally James Wan was going to produce this and Greg Russo was going to be the writer, but then they left the project, uh, ostensibly, I think, to kind of get into Aquaman and Malignant. And so they left in November 2018. Wan, James Wan left in December 2018. Uh, no, Mortal Kombat. I'm sorry. They were doing the Mortal Kombat remake. And that's the point where uh, Johannes Roberts stepped in to be both writer and director, uh, presumably because he was kind of passionate about the video games and was coming, you know, on the heels of like 47 meters down and 
47 meters down on cage, which is not very good. Um, <laughs> but uh, anyway, uh, maybe something you didn't know. Also, uh, what you may not have known, and I kind of spoiled this earlier, but um, the mansion and the police station both were taken from blueprints that Capcom provided so that they are like one-to-one replications of the video game sets. Uh, yeah, you can tell. Definitely looks like it. Uh, the police station looks closer to the one in the remake, I think, than it does in the the, the original part two. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think that's right. Um, also, here's something that uh, most people are definitely not going to know because it's more about me than it is about this movie. <laughs> but this movie was filmed oh you may not have known what here's something you you probably didn't know about me this movie <laughs> was filmed in Sudbury in Canada which interestingly to me is the place that Lost After Dark was filmed huh so uh it was interesting to watch it and be like oh yeah 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 okay so this is the same town where most of the exteriors and and most of the interiors were shot for uh, the movie that I wrote. So there you have it. There's there's what I have in common personally with uh, Resident Evil: Welcome to Raccoon City. And, wow, so you could actually play them both like on two different Blu-ray players and monitors and compare some of the locations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you could probably. I, I think there are a couple of the the town shots. Um, like, we didn't do a lot of exteriors for Lost After Dark, to be fair, so there's not a lot of shots of the town. Um, but, like, the high school uh, that we shot in is in Sudbury. So, yeah. I don't know how much, uh, how, how much overlap you would see, but yes, both of those films were shot predominantly in, in Sudbury, Canada. Um... Cool. I'll have to dig out my Lost After Dark Blu-ray and uh, compare and contrast, see if I can recognize anything from the movie. You should probably, yeah, and, and don't even worry about looking for it, you should probably just buy another copy. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I could just Venmo you your cut and then just find my Yeah, send me the two and a half cents that I, <laughs> I would make off of that. Um, but, Court, enough about me. Let's talk about uh, about where people can find more out of you um here on uh the podcast world <laughs> well the easiest place to find all things having to do with me is legionpodcast.com forward slash cinema dash psyops dash podcast that url just seems to get longer every year for me mm -hmm. man um <laughs> uh, also just if you search cinema psyops uh in in google we're gonna pop up because of the seo optimization on the site but also because we've been around for coming up on eight years now we're getting ready to do our run to close out uh year eight we have about three or four weeks left of uh just doing some movies to come out of the march mate that we just finished up as of this recording and uh then our end of the year run i've announced it on the show but i'm just gonna say it we're gonna go ahead to head we're gonna have sadako versus keiko oh that movie is near and dear to my heart well a couple of uh a folklorist to the 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 guy and the little girl fantastic characters really wonderful uh what we're actually going to do is we're going to do all of the japanese released ring films and all of the japanese released grudge films Ooh. uh and we're going to actually do the ring all the way up to sadako versus keiko i think is how we're going to end up doing it or or at the end of i can't remember exactly how i have it set up but i think at the end of the grudge is when we finally hit sadako versus keiko uh, as well but we're gonna do all of them like even like white ghost black ghost all of them yeah all the grudge films like we're going for it if it's the japanese release ones uh didn't have enough time to fit in the american release ones as well um that's why i just say i'm saying just the japanese ones uh matt has not really watched anything from japan yet so uh this horror film franchise fest is gonna probably blow his mind oh yeah yeah, yeah. the original grudge stands a real good chance of just straight up scaring the shit out of him that's a, oh yeah yeah that's a uh I, I i'm looking forward to listening to those that'll be a real good time um yeah uh and and uh i'll be back here in a second to uh close out the show but court thank you as always man this was a, a great time oh you can't keep me away from your podcast unless you're hitting me with a stick and telling me to go away and i've been a bad boy so. in, in fairness you're gonna be back in just a couple of short weeks as we dive into um april 
which is going to be all 80s horror movies. So, yeah, yeah get ready for that. I, I dove on my selection like a fucking hawk, too. The minute I saw that post, I was like, I know what I want, and I'm asking for it. Yeah, you sure did. So, uh, so yeah, so Court will be back uh, just in a couple of weeks, and I'll be back in uh, just a second. And uh, see you guys on the other side. All right, we had a quick introduction in the upfront of the show uh, because I'm going to backload all the information in the end of the show. So uh, gird your loins for some coming soons, uh, some some attractions, some some previews of what is to come. Uh, first of all, big thanks to Court. That was a, a really fun time chit chatting about the movie. And yeah, I, you know, it, it, the court and I always get, you know, fairly deep on stuff. And, um, I always want this show to be a little bit deeper in examination of the movie than just a cursory, like, is this good? Is this bad? And try to get to the whys of that. And, and also a little bit of the production stuff. And, uh, and I felt like we accomplished that the, this, this, uh, rates us a success in my book and uh, as i said i hope you enjoyed it but uh there's not time to linger there's no time to dally and pat ourselves on the shoulder for doing a good show L we have coming up uh this very week if you're listening to this on the the live public feed you are going to be getting an episode of heart of horror with uh, kate pollock that is going to land on the public feed on uh april 1st on april fool's day we will have another episode in april um, so you're getting a little bit of a twofer. It's really kind of the late March episode, but, uh, that's going to be a fun one. I assure you, we're going to be talking about kiss of the damned as well as what is sexy. So that should be a very fun conversation, a conversation we have yet to have, but I have a uh, high hopes for it. And then next week begins the April series. That's all going to be about eighties horror movies. Uh, I've got all the movies lined up. I've got all the hosts lined up. Court's going to be coming back uh, to talk about Happy Birthday to Me. Uh, next week, we're going to be talking about April Fool's Day. There's going to be some My Bloody Valentine. We're going to be talking some Hell Night. And, of course, the usual uh, What You Watching and Heart of Horror and some Found Footage Fools. And and I hopefully, I am almost at the point where I feel like you're about to start getting some bonus stuff that isn't the usual bonus stuff. Uh, so I'm very excited about next month and, and what is to come uh, here on the Dark Parade in the not-too-distant future. We are right around the corner from actually doing uh, some actual interviews and things like that. So uh, I'm very grateful to everyone who has come along thus far. I hope you're enjoying yourself, and I hope uh, that you'll continue to uh, you know rate and review uh, where you can, spread the word where you can. Uh, we're a, a scrappy little podcast, uh, even though I've been doing this for years and years, this is still, uh, a bit of a startup. So, uh, you know, spread it around. And also if you, uh, if you hop over to YouTube on the Legion podcasts, YouTube channel, which is youtube.com forward slash Legion podcasts, uh, you can also give the videos a thumbs up and that'll help the visibility there as well, uh, in their algorithm. And lastly, if you are not a subscriber to the Legion podcast Patreon, let me encourage you to do so because you can get all of these episodes uh, a couple of days early over there. And, uh, and yeah, and I'll, I'll be doing some bonus stuff, uh, over there as well. Um, in the not too distant future, probably that is also an April thing. You're probably not going to get a, a bonus episode from me, uh, in March on account of it almost being the end of it. But, uh, but soon. So, uh, and there's a lot of other great stuff over there. A lot of early access to various shows, some exclusive stuff on the Legion Patreon that you don't get anywhere else. So, uh, if you are not a subscriber and it's cheap, it's like a buck or two. So go over to patreon.com forward slash Legion podcasts and, uh, and you can become a supporter there and, uh, and you know, help everybody out, uh, who, who contributes to the network and that would be much appreciated. So, uh, anyway, like I told you. We were going to backload this with a, a lot of coming tunes, and there you have it. Uh, I thank you very much for listening to this episode. I hope you join us on the future episodes. And as always, thank you for being part of the Dark Parade. We'll see you next time. Bye.